Hi, everyone. Welcome to ITENIV Healthcare Solutions webinar, Make a Statement by Improving Your Next-Gen Practice Statements. My name is Lindsay Lanning, and I am the Manager of Client Development for ITENIV. Chelsea, our Marketing Communications Coordinator, who usually introduces us, is actually out on maternity leave, so I will do my best not to mess up while I explain the process for today's presentation. First, I would like to mention that this webinar will be recorded. We'll send out a copy of the slides and recording within the next week. Next, for those of you who aren't familiar with Itenib, I wanted to share a bit of who we are with you. We specialize specifically in next-gen healthcare. We are passionate about providing solutions for our healthcare provider partners, which in turn help them to improve patient care, enhance the patient experience, and maintain a financially healthy practice. So to sum it all up, we do everything next-gen. Oh, and we also have two productivity solutions that are add-ons for NextGen, ChartGuard and Refund Manager. Next, I wanted to mention some upcoming webinars. So on April 1st, we'll be presenting NextGen 594-844 Orlando release, Lessons Learned as a Beta Participant. Just announced, NextGen version 594-844 is being released on March 27th. And we want to be the first to tell you about it from real life experiences as a beta partner. We want to share with you all real insights into how these new features and added functionality affect your end users. So we're going to provide an in-depth analysis of some of the most notable changes, such as the completely revamped look and feel of the provider soap template, and also improvements to the hidden insurance workflow. We plan to take it a step further and include client feedback and our lessons learned from this specific upgrade. We will also have a webinar on April 15th, a deep dive into the next-gen transaction approval process. So make sure to keep your eyes out for this invitation. Okay, so back to today's webinar on make a statement by improving your next-gen practice statement. At the end of the presentation, we're going to open up the floor for questions from you. We will answer all questions at the end, but you may type them in the questions area of the webinar control panel whenever they occur to you. Finally, for audio query purposes, everyone's phone will remain muted throughout the entire webinar. If you experience any audio issues, please use the chat box to let us know so we can resolve them. And again, any questions may be answered in the questions. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our presenters for today. Dottie Pinnock is a managing consultant at iTennis, and Lexi DeMarsh is a manager of consultant development at iTennis. If you've ever worked with either, you know they are the true next-gen experts. So Lexi, I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to you first for a brief introduction. The webinar is all yours. Take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Lindsay. So hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today for our webinar, uh, Make a Statement by Improving Your Next-Gen Practice Statement. So we chose this topic um, because there are so many options for sending patient statements in next-gen, and it really is a fundamental part of the revenue cycle for all practices. So today we're going to be sharing our knowledge um, on the configuration and generation of patient statements. Um, so hopefully we can help your practice send the right statements for the right patients at the right time. So first, we couldn't resist giving you some background and industry information. Um, just basically why is this so important uh, before we actually jump into the next gen piece of it. So right now, practices are being tasked with staying afloat um, amidst an ever-changing reimbursement. So there are constant legislative changes um, to reimbursement uh, through things like MACRA and new EM coding and reimbursement guidelines and so much more. So in order to maintain a successful physician practice, uh, providers all over the country are being forced to get creative. So with how they earn um, and maintain revenue, because as we're about to see, reimbursement is not keeping up with inflation. So this chart um, is from an article from Health Affairs Journal, and it shows that from 2001 to 2014, uh, general inflation increased 33.4%, and physician practice expenses increased 60.6%. To make matters worse, Medicare payment rates only went up 2.9%. So as you can see, the gap between the red line, which represents the cost of running a practice, compared to that green line, which shows Medicare payments, that gap is increasing year by year. So that slight bump that we're seeing in Medicare reimbursement is nowhere near the average inflation, which is represented by the blue line on this chart. So what this means is your practice's costs are increasing each year, 
but reimbursements are not keeping up. So with a rise in high deductible plans, um, and we're also seeing patients struggling to pay off medical bill balances, having an accurate and timely patient statements um, leaving your practice is becoming more important than ever. So I'm sure that many, if not all of you, uh, that have joined the webinar today are familiar with what a patient statement is. So I'm not gonna take your time giving you a full lengthy explanation. Um, you can use this screen as a reference, so either for yourself or if any of your staff members need it, um, and we will be sending these slides out. Um, but just briefly, a patient statement is a printed bill um, that shows information such as the patient pay amount, uh, service dates, charges, transactions. So, and on this screen, we include an example of a statement that was generated from NextGen. So, hopefully we've provided some insight into why this topic is so important. Um, we can tell that provider reimbursement really is in danger and it's a critical time in the industry. Uh, you want to check the pulse on the financial health of your practice and make sure you're doing everything you can to increase practice revenue. So especially in ways that aren't linked to regulations, you know, things that your practice can actually control. Uh, one important tool in managing your revenue cycle with the NextGen application is patient statements. So the more we can understand you know, the logic, the more likely we are to take full advantage of its functionality. So now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Dottie and she's gonna explain some of the ways um, that you can improve statements in your own practice. Thank you, Lexi. Um, as Lexi said earlier, patient statements are one of the cornerstones in any revenue cycle process. So today, I'm going to do a deep dive into the logic that NextGen uses in generating patient statements. We're going to look at some pro um, common problems, some common causes, and then try to give you some tips for finding these issues and resolving them within your practice. So let's start with some of the common problems that are encountered when sending patient statements. And I hope you guys don't feel like you're drinking from a fire hose today, but I have a lot to cover. So I'm gonna try to go through this um, as thoroughly as I can. There are many factors that determine which patients will receive a statement, and consequently, we see some very common problems. Patients aren't getting statements or they're getting statements for the wrong amount. And it's also pretty common to see patients who are receiving way too many statements before any follow-up action is done. Um, lastly, sometimes we see where the statements aren't aging correctly or the practice doesn't even understand how they are aging. Our experience has shown us that most of these problems are caused by system configuration. Most typically, either in practice preferences or the actual statement generation process being used, um, either manually or by the BBP. Some other issues can be related to actions taken by the users that maybe they don't fully understand that um, set that manually um, uh, suppress statements. So we're gonna try and divide and conquer these. And the first thing we're gonna review is the system configuration. If there's one thing you can say about NextGen is there are a lot of preferences. Anybody who uses NextGen knows it's highly configurable and you get lots of choices. The bad news is there's a lots of choices and sometimes the wording isn't particularly self-evident. Um, and that's specifically true when it comes to patient statements. So today we're gonna to try to divide and conquer all these preferences and make sure that you're setting yours up to get the desired result. So the first place we're gonna start is in the statements tab in practice preferences. Let's see if we can fully understand the way statement cycles work. I know it seems kind of self-evident, but in a way, it kind of isn't. Um, one of the first questions I always get, and some of the biggest confusion comes from existing accounts and new accounts. So that's where I'm gonna start. An account is only new once. So the way accounts get created is when an encounter is attached 
a created and a guarantor is attached, if that person has never been used as a guarantor before, the minute an encounter is attached with that person record as a guarantor, an account is created. That is the only time that that account is considered new. The existing interval kicks out after that initial statement for the new account is sent in, sent out. So for example, if a new patient is seen on January 1st and a new account is created, the first encounter is going to create that, and it's going to set the next patient statement to January 16th, which is 15 days later. The patient will get a statement on the 16th, and then thereon, forever and after, they will qualify for a statement 30 days later. So if they pay off that bill and come back in a year, they're never going to be new again. So that's a, that creates another phenomena called the next statement due date being way in the past. So if you notice in my example here, the next statement due date is a long time ago. Well, how can that happen? So here's basically how it happens. Let's go back to our example where a patient is new, they get a statement on January 16th, and then 30 days later, they get a statement on February 15th. When they get that February statement, it stamps their next statement due date for March, right? 30 days later. So they're, they're set to receive a statement in March. If in the meantime, before March, they pay that balance off, nothing will ever change that next statement due date. It will always say March. Let's say this happened in 2018. So that next statement due date will always be March 16th, 17th of 2018. If I don't have a qualifying balance until today, because my next statement due date is today or before, I will immediately drop into the queue to get another statement. So if we have any questions about that, feel free to ask them. Um, I know it seems a little complicated, but a lot of, I get this question all the time. How can the next statement date be in the past? Well, that just means they haven't had a qualifying balance since they were last put into the queue. Now, update, so updating that last statement date, that checkbox there, is what happens. So when I send a statement date, that's what stamps my next statement due date. The option here that says update dates on forced statements, we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes when I show you what um, um, actually forces a statement. You'll see what that um, refers to. So the next thing I want to talk about is configuring this, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I went backwards. I was like, wait a minute. Um, so now let's talk about what qualifies the patient for a statement. I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, so what qualifies the patient for a statement is first, we talked about the cycle, so we know when they're going to drop into the queue. The first thing that qualifies them for a statement is the most self-evident thing, and that's the balance. So in my example here, I've got $10, but if the balance, the patient balance amount is between $10 and $9,999.99, that patient is going to get, going to be qualified for a statement, right? So that's pretty simple. And the, the radio button here says, are we looking at only the patient balance or do we want to include the insurance balance as well? Typically, most practices use the patient balance only, but there are some exceptions where practices may want to show their patients what's outstanding to the insurance, especially if they don't really expect the insurance to pay all of those things. So the next option, and it's the much less obvious option, is show only encounters with a patient balance. Now, that really should be self-evident, but in reality, it is not. Recently, there was a change to the logic in this feature that allows it to now take into account the total account balance and the account balance that includes unapplied 
credit. So in other words, if a patient has an account level unapplied credit that is greater than their outstanding line item patient balances, if this option is selected, it will not, the patient will not qualify for a statement because it's looking at the entire account. So the decision on whether to turn this on or off might depend on whether how you're using account level unapplied credits. So for example, if you're using account level unapplied credits to be deposit on future services, it may suppress the patient from getting a statement on all their past services, and that may not be the result that you're looking for. Conversely, if you have a lot of unapplied payment, uh, account level payments that are out there, in all likelihood that having the patient get a statement without um, offsetting that would result um, in credit balances, then you may want to consider turning that on. Again, it looks at the total balance. So if you've got a balance of 500 and an account level on applied of 400, it won't suppress the statement. But if your account level on applied is greater than or equal to the full outstanding balance, it will suppress the statement. And it may not work that way in your system if you are on an earlier version. So I'm not exactly sure what version that was added, but it was sometime in 5.9. The next thing um, is insurance payments generate statements. This is an old option that's been out there a long time. I don't have many clients that use it, but it is available. And if you do that, what happens is every single time a transaction is posted, it will force that um, statement, it'll force the statement on the next statement run even if the patient isn't due for a statement. So remember I showed you on the prior slide, update forced statement date, that's the link back to this option that insurance payments force or generate statements. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. The next thing I wanna talk about are the station, uh, statement aging options. They're pretty self-evident, so based on your preference, you can age either by the charge service date, encounter date, patient responsible date. Um, most people elect the date of patient responsibility, but I just want to review just very briefly the consequences. So if you use either service date or encounter date, and the insurance is outstanding. So let's say the data service was January and the insurance has been outstanding and they finally clear up in April. It's possible that the patient would get a statement saying their balance was greater than 90 days old. And this is their very first statement if you're aging on the encounter date or the data service. Conversely, they would get a statement if you use patient responsibility date, even though the service was performed in January, it would be 30 days old. So that's kind of how the logic behind that works. And I just wanted to touch on it. The next thing I wanna talk about, and I think this is a very critical um, feature in the application. And my experience working with lots and lots of clients has been that it's pretty widely misunderstood or not even used at all. So I'm going to take just a second to walk you through statement counters, what they are, why we have them, and what they're intended to do. So first and foremost, there are two kinds, account level and encounter level. The easiest is the encounter level. Every time a balance from this encounter appears on a statement, the encounter level statement counter increments. It never resets. It's just adds up how many times this encounter has appeared on a statement, period. No, no other logic, no other brains. Differently, however, account level statement counters are more complicated. I'm gonna take you back a little bit to the beginning and share with you the logic that was used on statement counters uh, when they were first developed. 
So first, let me honestly tell you that I, I've worked with many, many next gen practices over the years. I've been, uh, I worked for next gen and I've been in the offices of many next gen practices. And I can honestly tell you that not one single practice I've ever worked with told me they had too many people and not enough patient balances to work. And in fact, that's probably the reality in your practice. If it's not, well, you're, you're definitely the exception. And the other thing that I see repeatedly, in fact, I was just in a practice last week where they don't have anybody dedicated to following up patient balances because it's, it's kind of like an afterthought more than a priority in the big AR picture. Um, so the theory behind statement counters is, is this. If you've got more patient balances than you have staff to work, the statement counter can help you bubble up to the top accounts where the patient is not even trying to make a payment. Because if you don't have enough staff and you have a lot of patient balances and patients are making payments that you find acceptable, you don't have time to worry about the universe anyway. Let's just focus on those patients who aren't even trying. So that's sort of the idea. Um, if you have your statement counter preferences set the way this is shown here, where the patient has to make 100% of their balance um, for it to be, quote, acceptable and reset the statement counter, then it kind of defeats the whole purpose of the statement counter functionality. Because you're saying, I want to know every single time every single patient gets a bill that they don't pay. What some practices do is they sit down with their internal team and does design a policy that says, okay, what do we consider an acceptable effort? Is it 20%? It, so in other words, if the patient owes $100 and they pay 20, is that okay? If they owe $1,000 and they pay 200, is that okay? Sometimes it's a flat dollar amount. I've been in clients' uh, offices where they say, our doctors say if they're making $10 a month, that's good enough for them. Well, you know, it's, it's up to the practice how to do that. You can use both a flat dollar and a, an acceptable percentage, but if you fill in both of these parameters, it has to meet both conditions. So if both of these are filled in, let's say I've got a minimum dollar of tw uh, 25 and 20%, and the patient owes $25 but only sends me 20, it will not reset their statement counter. So you really have to think about what you consider to be an acceptable payment that allows you to stay off the bottom, uh, stay down at the bottom of the pile and let those people who are not making acceptable payments sort of float up to the top. It also can act as a way to send, um, you know, we saw in the slide before, you can choose to, to send um, gunning messages based on the statement counter. And so let me give you an example of kind of how that would work. I owe $100 and I already sent you a $35 payment and another $35 payment. So I, I owe you $100, but I've already paid two thirds of it. If you're just aging on data patient responsibility, even though I'm trying to make payments, my Dunning message is going to get stronger and stronger. So that's why sometimes you don't want to get those messages stronger and stronger if patients are trying to make their payments. But again, it's really determined by your internal policies. Um, so what happens is your options here, when you pick um, your Dunning messages, you can pick them either by the aging we talked about or by the statement counter. If you're doing Dunning messages, um, whether regardless of which mechanism you're using, you can suppress them at the account level. If there's some reason, or your staff can suppress them at the account level, if there's some reason you don't want to um, have patients get that. Now, it's also worth noting that many of you outsource your statements. 
And these Dunning messages or statement counters can also drive certain things to happen via your statement vendor. I've seen clients who have, who use the statement counter and after the third, uh, when the statement counter increments to three, they have their um, statement vendor not send a regular statement, but send a letter. So the, the patient thinks they're actually getting a collection letter and they don't get an additional statement. But again, that's up to you and your statement vendor. It's just one of the options available. So I don't want to spend too much time on that because there are a lot of other things to cover, um, but I do think it's important. Other options for how data displays on the statement um, include all of these. So credit balances, that's another one that's sometimes confused. The option to display credit balances does not mean line item credits. It only refers to unapplied credits. So if you select the display credit balances, it's going to roll up all your encounter and account level unapplied and print those on the bottom of the statement as a note. Nothing really suppresses line item um, credits if there is a total overall balance due when the patient qualifies for a statement. Um, there are other pretty self-evident options, including outsourced bad debt and in-progress items. Those are choices in the statement preferences that you can choose if you want to put those on a statement or not. And then include all line items. What this means is that if there's any line item within the encounter that qualifies to appear on the statement, all the line items for that same encounter will also appear even if some of them have been paid off. Exclude history, um, last, uh, last history payment. It always, it always frustrates me when some are include and some are exclude because you kind of have to reverse your thinking. But if this is not selected, it'll show the last paid encounter and the associated transactions on the statement. Uh, the reason a lot of people do this is because the patient will call and say, hey, I made a payment, but I don't see it on my bill. Um, and sometimes that can resolve that. Obviously, excluding void activity, um, anytime you void charges, you may not want to show that uh, to the patient unless you, for whatever reason, do want to show that they called and, and asked you to void something and then you voided it for them. So that's just basically a choice there. Um, the detailed statement options, again, I think all of you have played with this in your own practices and most people know if you're going to use detail um, I pretty much recommend that you use the grid lines because it really helps. Um, those detailed statements can be very, very um, hard to read if you don't have the grid lines. Here are some other cu customized messages that you can add here, and I'm just going to sort of show you what they look like when you do. So based on your practice preferences, this is where the header, uh, the default body, and then lastly, the default footer message goes down here. If you're displaying unapplied, if, you're, if you've got that option selected to display credit balances, here's the message that overrides that footer message. So it, unapplied credits would just eliminate this footer message and replace it with the unapplied amount if that's what you've chosen. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's some things on the forms tab as well that uh, control what print on statements. So all of these options, the checks payable, remit address, I'm not going to read all these to you. They're pretty self-evident, but these things control what print here. And then these things allow you to adjust with either positive or negative numbers exactly where they print so that they fit within the envelope correctly. And of course, the credit cards. Um, so the credit cards are going to, if you, whichever ones you have selected, if you have none selected, you won't see them, but whichever ones you have selected, that's going to determine um, what prints on the top there. Most of you know that, but again, for the sake of completeness, I just want to make sure um, that I covered everything that controls what prints on a statement. Another issue that we discussed earlier that I want to walk you through is patients that are getting statements for amounts they already paid, and that's 
specifically co-payments. One of the most common causes for this um, is, is the options during the actual statement generation process. So what some practices do, and it really is gonna depend on the internal policies of your practice for how you collect and post unapplied co-payments, but if the patient qualifies for a statement today and they get a new visit and that visit has a copay and they have paid that copay as an unapplied credit, but it has not yet been posted, the unapplied hasn't yet been applied and posted, then they will get a bill potentially for the service that they just paid for today. So that's why when you're generating statements, either manually or setting up the job to do this from the BBP, it gives you the option to leave out uh, charge activity through certain dates. So most people pick two or three days here and it just leaves that charge activity off the, uh, off the statement so the patient isn't being billed for co-pays they've already paid. Um, I don't wanna go too fast, so I'll kind of pause. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask them. The other thing I wanna to touch on, and not everybody uses this, so I'm just gonna to touch on it very briefly. If there are some of you who need the specific details behind how this works, I will be more than happy to stay on after the call and make sure that you understand this. But the system allows you to send multiple statements broken by either guarantor or by patients, even if those patients are on the same account. And it also lets you print one statement per location or per rendering. If for whatever use, reason you are using the option to print statements by rendering or by location, there are some very specific things that you need to know, particularly if there's any possibility that a patient has been seen in, uh, uh, by both. So for example, if I've seen Dr. Smith and Dr. Adams, um, and I'm gonna print statements by rendering, I have to be very careful that I don't update the last statement date because accounts are, uh, statements are at the account level and regardless of how many providers I saw, I still only have one account. So again, I'm not gonna bore everyone with the details, but if this is something that you think you're interested in or you think you need to know, please stay on the line and I will help you at the end ensure that you get this correctly. Um, sorry. I don't know why it went backwards. I don't know why it did that. Sorry, guys. It just totally went to the wrong place. I'm so sorry. Apparently, if you push the up button, it goes to the statement before. And if you push the down button, it goes to the uh, slide after. So please apologize, um, accept my apology for that. So there are times when a practice may decide not to send a statement and NextGen has a bazillion options. Well, maybe not a bazillion, maybe only six for accomplishing this and understanding um, each one of them is really important, especially when you're trying to troubleshoot why something doesn't appear on a statement. So now I push the page down slide. And the first place you can suppress is from the um, payer master file. So this is kind of a little known fact, but it is possible to suppress certain balances from statements uh, in the payer master file. It doesn't work the way you might think it works. So what happens is if you're using insurance balances and patient balances to generate the statement qualification, which would mean that you'd have some encounters on there that only had insurance balances, this is an option to leave those balances for this payer off of the statement. 
But if for whatever reason, regardless of the payer or the payer master selection, a patient balance is um, um, generated for this encounter, that balance will still go on the statement. So as long as the patient bucket is empty, these will be suppressed. But the minute there's a balance in the patient bucket, these encounters will appear on the statement regardless of the payer setting. The next thing is suppressing by service items. This is kind of a relatively new, uh, it hasn't been around forever and ever, and some people don't know about it. Um, some clients use this to suppress certain line items from their statement. I have one client who uses a $0 deposit charge. So they enter a $0 deposit for their prospective services. They put the money on that and they leave that off the statement so that it, it doesn't uh, artificially reduce the amount that a patient um, gets a statement for. So there are a couple of different ways that people use this. Uh, some people use it for like PQRS codes and other tracking codes um, that they don't want to actually appear on the statement, but they want to be able to uh, report, enter and report on. The next level that it can be suppressed is at the account level. So if a statement the print statement indicator is removed here. It removes it for the entire account. A very common example of what this might be used for is if you get a bad address. So if you get a mail return, there's no sense continuing to mail things. The challenge that I find is I go back into a practice and five years ago they had a bad address. Now they have a good address and the patient still isn't getting any statements. So if you're going to develop a process where you take the statement indicator off, you might want to consider a process to put it back on if you get a new address. Uh, some people use patient status. They have a status of that address, and that status has to be changed. Um, uh, so you get an alert every time. So when you get a good address and the patient comes back into the practice or whatever, it requires um, somebody to change that status or at least it notifies you so that you can and that might trigger um, some kind of warning for you to go back and turn that print statement indicator on. I've, I've created a couple workflows for clients to help them with this, but it's something you can develop internally. The next place that a um, chart can, uh, a statement can be suppressed is at the chart level. So in the chart details, and the other kind of fun thing about this is it puts a little printer icon here. If you take this print statement indicator off, it won't have a print icon. So you can check and see whether the statement is turned off without actually opening up all these places. Um, if it's deselected, um, then only this patient, not the whole account, but only this patient won't get a statement. The most granular level um, for patients is at the encounter level. And there are a lot of options. Uh, a lot of times when clients may not want to build specific encounters or they may not want those to show on the statement. I have some clients who use it for um, drug study patients. I have some clients who provide services for minors that they are not allowed to bill for. And this is a good way uh, to manage that, those statements or that statement suppression. The next one I wanna talk about, and this is kind of another one that, that you may not think of in the billing office because sometimes people in the billing office had nothing to do with people that set up the patient portal. But if you're using the patient portal and you open up the online practice settings in the master file, there is a statement and payments tab here. And these three options, on the statement and patient the payments tab, control statements um, as well as the ones inside the application. So uh, they're kind of self-evident. The first one, the patient will always receive a paper statement no matter what. The second one allows the patient to determine if they want to keep getting paper statements or if they want to opt for electronic statements only. 
And then if you choose the last one, there are no paper statements. Everything goes to the portal. So this is set up at, uh, via the practice. And this determination can be why you're not getting statements on some of your patients. Um, so again, you can see here when you register, if you're allowing the patient to choose and you do the patient uh, portal patient enrollment, there is an option here that says send paper statements. If you're only sending patient, patient statements via that um, option I showed you before, this is actually grayed out. And I thought it would be interesting to show you what the patients see, because sometimes one of the challenges in the portal is we don't see what the patients see. So in this example of a portal patient, um, you can see that they've chosen um, you can choose to receive your statements online by checking the option below. So if you've got it enabled for the patients to be able to do that, they can do that. But this practice says that they're not using that option. So the patient gets a message that says, currently this practice doesn't have the online statement options turned on. So it's telling you that you, you here it tells you you can select, but here it tells you your practice doesn't have that turned on. So I just thought I'd give you a little window into what the um, patients are seeing when they log into their portal. So because there are so many ways to suppress patients from getting a statement, um, there are several safeguards in NextGen that can help you. And one of them is tasking and one of them is reporting. So report at the account chart and encounter, because remember, I told you, you've got the ability to suppress at those three levels. You can subsequently report at those three levels. There are statement indicators um, to evaluate which accounts, charts, encounters um, have the statement turned off. Likewise, there are three source types in tasks. Each one has an option to notify someone or create a task when the um, statement is turned off and or on for a certain amount of, uh, excuse me, when it's turned off at any of the levels for a certain amount of days. So that's sort of the safety behind um, managing those suppressed statements, right? Um, reporting. So we talked about uh, reporting just a little bit on how reporting can help you with statement counters, but I wanna just take a minute before we wrap up and talk about how reporting can help you manage statements overall. So are there any questions before I go forward? Okay. This is an example of a report that I ran, and it starts from the menu reports general statements. And what I did to set this up is I got, I got my statement create date. I grouped it by statement create date. I used the totals tab to count how many IDs, uh, so how many accounts were being sent statements. So again, in my totals tab, you've got the choice to, to count a data element. So I picked account IDs. I looked at the average payment amount. Again, in the totals tab, you can either get a sum or an average. So I wanted to look for each statement run, what was the average amount of patient balance that I was sending out. And then for, just for comparison and just sort of completeness sake, I went ahead and looked at the average insurance amount. So my patients are, that got statements on these intervals, I can see how often I'm sending statements, how many statements I'm sending at each interval, and sort of the average amount that goes out on every single patient statement. And this is a pretty good way to track to make sure that statements are going out Maybe some of your cycles got a little off balance. You can see here that I send um, pretty much every two or three times a week and my statement cycles are a little bit off balance. They're pretty heavily weighted on the fourth. Um, not sure what happened here. Any number of things could have happened. Uh, I could have gotten a large um, remittance which left patient balances, a lot more patient balances. 
Um, but it at least gives you a snapshot and an overview of how many statements you're sending out, what kind of balances they are, and what intervals you're going at. Uh, there are other options for printed and exporting as well. I just tried to make it really simple. The other report that I want to share with you, and this one comes from Accounts Receivable Collection Account Summary. This is a report that I use a lot when I'm helping clients um, for several things. I mean, there, there's a bunch of different things you can use on here, but there's a couple things that I'm going to call to your attention that I think are worthwhile. So what I did is I looked at the person number, just because I wanted to de-identify it. I try to avoid um, patient names whenever possible, but I looked at the person number, if there is a self less, less bad debt and if they have a bad debt amount as well, this unapplied amount will actually add up in counter and account level unapplied um, available to that account. The statement indicator column tells me the ones that are blank tells me that the statement is not even turned on. I'm looking at the next statement print date and the last self pay date and maybe the last letter date. So if I'm trying to do some real work and I added all these there for different things and we can talk about what they're all um, what they're all for. But this is an example of all the fields that I think are really pertinent when you're trying to evaluate your overall patient balances. And then the next thing I left on here is my statement counter. And as you can see, this one patient has gotten 21 statements without an acceptable payment, which would have reset their statement counter. Now, one of the challenges with having it at 100% is they could have pay, may, been making payments all along, but they just never got down to completely 100% paid off. So they're still getting statements. It doesn't mean that they aren't um, making some payment. It just means that their statement counter is not being reset. And typically I see that when the practice preferences are set the way I showed you, instead of having more um, acceptable parameters included. But when, if you want to look at, this report can be used for several things. If you want to look at the statements that are going out that um, have unapplied credits, you can go into your filter and um, change it to unapplied amount not equal zero, and that will show you how many people are about to get statements that have an unapplied credit that maybe needs to be applied before those come out. So there are a lot of things you can look at. This will also show you the patients who've never made a self-pay payment. Maybe they've gotten a lot of statements and they've never made a self-pay payment. Um, so this report, I don't think, is as widely used as it should be, and hopefully you'll find something that's valuable to your practice um, by looking at this report a little bit closer. So in closing, um, you know, when I read this, I had to laugh out loud. I don't think NextGen has an enhancement for that, but maybe we should. Um, so I'm going to turn it over at this point. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to stick around um, and answer as many as we have. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dottie. Um, I know that was a lot of really helpful um, and informative content. So if anyone uh, is out there and is feeling a bit overwhelmed or you're interested in learning even more or perhaps getting assistance with your current next gen revenue cycle management environment, um, we can help assess your current situation. Um, Dot, if you want to flip forward one slide for me, it'll show us kind of the same thing that I'm, I'm saying here. We can provide recommendations. We can help implement new processes and procedures surrounding statements and, of course, other revenue cycle functions. Um, so next, if you want to flip forward one more for me, you can feel free to visit our website that's listed on the screen. Um, absolutely continue to sign up for our webinars um, and consider some of the other services we offer. We do offer some on-site consultations for EHR, uh, PM, revenue cycle, front office, as well as technology and performance, and of course, test drive our products as well. Um, 
And then you can always reach out to us directly. Um, I have mine and Lexi's contact information listed on the screen. Um, if you have any questions for Dottie, you can email either of us and we'll, we'll get it to the right person as well. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and open the floor up for questions from you all. If you have any questions you would like to ask our presenters, you may type them in the questions area of the webinar control panel. Um, again, we did have a few questions come in throughout the presentations um, in regards to sending out the slides. So we will be sending out a copy of the slides and a recording to everyone who registered within the next week or so. Um, also got some feedback that the intro was a bit choppy, so I apologize for the audio on my end. Um, but again, the copy of the slides and the recording will be going out within the next week or so. Um, so it looks like we have our first question here um, coming in from a user. So Dottie or Lexi, feel free to jump in on this. Most likely probably you, Dottie, will, will take this one, but it says, we've been getting a pop-up for statement exceptions. What are they and do you have any recommendations for managing them? Yeah, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, statement exceptions are encounters where there is no rendering provider. Now you say, how can that happen? Well, in most practices, it doesn't happen. That's why statement exceptions are pretty rare, um, but it can happen sometimes if you have an HL7. There are a lot of ways that um, charges can go in that aren't necessarily in the front door. So if you've got charges going in or if you're not requiring rendering all the time, but typically statement exceptions look for things that don't have a rendering provider on the encounter. Um, I recommend that you don't check for statement exceptions because if there is something that's a statement exception, it can blow up the whole job, especially if you're running it via the BBP. If you have an issue with there being no rendering, there's a much easier report that you can run for that to manage it. Uh, but that's what statement exceptions are. And there's an option in practice preferences to check for statement exceptions. There's likewise one in the BBP job. And if you deselect those, it should resolve that problem. Perfect, sounds great, thank you so much. I'll move on to our um, next question as well. Oh, also we had a comment um, come in about that question as well. Um, and it said, NextGen just recently added statement exceptions for unapplied cred credits uh, present as well. Um, any follow-up comment on that, Dottie? Or I think that was just informative and, and thank you for participating. Our, yeah, no, that's, uh, if that's a new option, it, 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 or if they're saying it's a new option in a version, then it, it, I haven't seen that yet. It may be out in a new version. Perfect. Well, thank you guys for, for comments as well and participating. Um, the next question we had come in is, can I use the statement report to follow up on statements generated from the BBP? Um, yeah, you can use, um, when you get the statement report, you can snapshot that statement report and then work it in the application. There's a couple different ways to do it, but yeah, you can either export the Excel version of the report, the statement generated report, or create a snapshot, which can be viewed in the PM application. Perfect, thank you. Um, just reminding everyone again, it looks like we might have one or two coming in, but we, we do have a few minutes left. If you guys have any questions at all, feel free to type them in that questions area of the webinar control panel. Um, if nothing's coming to you right now, our contact information is, is uh, gonna be set out with the slide deck um, as well. I think it's more of a testament to you, Dottie, on um, kind of being absolutely thorough on this presentation and, and really going through everything and, and taking us through that. So um, if we don't have any other questions coming in, it doesn't look like anything is last minute. Um, I wanna thank both Lexi and Dottie for your time today. And thank you all for taking the time out of your busy day to attend. Um, again, we'll make sure to get those slides and recordings out within the next week. Looks like no other questions. So thank you all again, and I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Thanks. Thanks, thank everyone. You.